The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, I just got the signal, we're good to go. So my name is uh, Drew Levine and I'm with IX Systems uh, that uh, develops uh, the FreeNAS open source project. I see a lot of familiar faces. How many people uh, attended the FreeNAS talk last year? Right here, a couple of people. So one of the things I wanted to do today was to talk about all the changes that have happened in the last year. Uh, but I also wanted to make sure those that are new to FreeNAS um, get a bit of an introduction so know what it is that we're talking about. So in this talk, we'll start with an introduction, uh, just so if you're unfamiliar with FreeNAS, you know what it is. I'll do a bit of an overview of the features, uh, what you can expect out of this NAS product. One of the best things about FreeNAS is the ZFS file system, and a lot of people are new to that, so I'll do a quick overview of those features as well. I'll then talk about the changes that have happened since last July, because we've had a couple of major releases since then. And we're actually ready to go into beta this month uh, for the upcoming 9.1. And you guys uh, will be the first people in the world to see uh, a sneak uh, preview of what to expect in 9.1. So you're very lucky people. And I have a bunch of additional resources. Uh, the very last slide at the end uh, has the URL to this presentation uh, so that you can go back and look at the references if you're interested. So we'll just start with a quick introduction. Uh, what is FreeNAS? It is an open source uh, network attached storage. It allows you to um, uh, build a NAS device using an embedded version of FreeBSD, which is known as NanoBSD. Um, it is an open source project and we've kept the two clause BSD license. For those that are interested in uh, enterprise grade support and hardware, uh, that is available from the company IX Systems. And the supported product is the same as FreeNAS, but we call it TrueNAS. And it's actually been developed for the hardware uh, that you would purchase. So that is an option that's available. Whole bunch of features come with FreeNAS. Um, FreeNAS was originally developed about 10 years ago, and it was uh, an open source project that grew over time. And one of the things they found out over time is there was a bit of a problem in the original design. So it was basically a full operating system with a whole kitchen sink approach to it. When the lead developer retired from the project, he was no longer able to maintain it. It was decided, well, that's a pretty good time to go back to the drawing board and let's design this. Uh, let's do it as specifically a NAS device, but let's give the ability uh, for um, admins to add on the software that they need. Because admins sometimes want to do some really funky stuff with their NAS other than just storage. So the new design um, uh, originally focused on what we called the core NAS, and these are the features I'm talking about now. And then I'll do a bit of an overview of the modular plugin architecture that allows you to install your own software. So if we look at what's built into the NAS itself, um, it supports two file systems. So UFS, uh, good old Unix file system, it's been around forever, as well as ZFS. We recommend ZFS, and if you're unfamiliar with ZFS, the more you learn about it, the more you learn that it's really well designed for storage and for data reliability. If you already have an existing UFS or ZFS uh, RAID volume, you can import that in, so you don't have to back up and, and create a new file system. You can also grab data from existing UFS, DOS, NTFS, and EXT23 file systems. Once you've set up your storage areas, you have great flexibility in how you uh, provide access to that storage. So we support uh, the Apple Talk protocol, NFS, and SMB. You can also have your clients going through FTP or secure FTP, SSH, 
or you can create uh, iSCSI uh, targets. If you already have an existing Active Directory or OpenLDAP network, you can import in all of your users and permissions. You can um, set up a schedule to automate uh, secure replication using rsync and SSH. And one of the things you can do with ZFS is you can create snapshots, which literally are the file system at that point in time. And later on, you could go back to that point in time if you need to restore what a file looked like. Those are called snapshots, and you can automate how often those occur and then you could replicate them if you wish to another system. ZFS also provides something called scrubs, where it will go in and check all the checksums on your disk blocks, and if it finds any corrupt checksums, it will attempt to fix the data. So that's something that should be uh, scheduled. And we have an automated scheduler. Uh, we have a couple of uh, front ends in the GUI to make some system administration tasks easier. So rather than remembering where to put your asterisk in a cron job, you can just pick stuff out in the GUI when you'd like your scripts to run. Uh, if you're familiar with FreeBSD, you know that you can uh, interact with the running kernel using sysctls. We have a front end GUI for that. And if you want to load extra drivers or anything else that uh, kernel load time, we have a front end to loader.conf. We also have all kinds of nice reporting graphs. You can schedule smart tasks for your disks. We have an automated alert system uh, that provides a visual indication if there's something that needs to be looked at. And we support UPS using that. Features keep on coming, so we're still in the core NAS. Uh, we do support link aggregation, um, uh, failover support, and also VLAN support, uh, DDNS, SNMP, and TFTP, so if you're storing, say, your Cisco images. You can um, create data sets that your Mac clients can do their backups using Time Machine, and we also support Windows shadow copies. Um, so if you're doing ZFS snapshots, your uh, Windows users in Explorer can right-click a file and view that file's previous versions and restore a previous version. Uh, there's a nice graphical control panel where you can go in and stop and start your services and view their status. So those are basically our core features. The design of the OS is that it should always be separate from your storage. So it's not designed to be installed on a disk. It's meant to be installed either on a, a USB stick or a flash card. And um, whenever you do an upgrade of the operating system, it always keeps a backup of the old one. So should an upgrade go wrong, uh, you simply reboot into your old operating system. It's designed to be administrated through a web browser. So when you uh, boot up the operating system, it'll attempt to get a DHCP address, and it'll tell you what address to point your web browser to. And one of the nice things from my point of view, uh, because I, I write the documentation, is that we do publish a user's guide with each version of the OS. So you always read the guide that goes with your version, and we publish it in multiple formats. And we always have that ready uh, for release date. So those are our features. If we just do sort of a very quick uh, ZFS 101, uh, for those not familiar with ZFS, it's a 128-bit file system. So yes, you can store a lot of stuff on it. It was designed um, to be self-healing. So whenever it writes data, it uses checksums, and it records that data. So it's there to provide that integrity. And when you do your scrubs, it will let you know if it had to fix any blocks. And that is usually a very early indication that you may have a disk that needs some attention. Snapshots are point in time, and they're very lightweight. So the first time you take a snapshot of a file system, it's actually zero bytes in size. It's just basically a pointer uh, in the ZFS logic. And snapshots only grow in size um, as the data changes. 
One of the nice things about CFS is it's a copy on write file system, which means when you change a file, it doesn't write to the original disk block. It actually writes elsewhere. And that's one of the reasons why it can go back in time to look at a previous version of a file. So your scrubs verify your integrity. A lot of people are excited about deduplication, and for some workloads that's appropriate. If you have a lot of duplicate data, so for example, you're, you're storing um, uh, virtual images, virtual machines, it will go in and remove the duplicate data. So you can actually save a lot of space. And one of the other things that takes a while to wrap your head around when it comes to ZFS, so normally when you format a file system, you have to think ahead of time, what's going to be the size of my USR and VAR and EPC, how you set it up. And it sort of locks in those sizes at file creation time. With ZFS, you instead uh, feed uh, what's known as a pool, the disks that you want to use as storage. And then as you want to uh, basically partition your storage, you create things known as data sets. They're sort of like a file system, and they're sort of like a directory. So you can create as many as you want, and they have access to the full storage pool, but you can do cool things like set quotas on a per data set basis. So you can have each user can have their own data set with a different size quota. You can create uh, data sets that will have compression on and store data on that data set that would benefit from compression. So you can do cool things like that. The other thing that ZFS does is it uh, uses its own software RAID. And the RAID was designed to overcome some of the limitations of hardware RAID. And when you're looking at uh, ZFS RAID, it's called a RAID Z. And the number after the RAID Z tells you how many disks you can lose without losing your data. So in a RAID Z1, you could lose one disk. RAID Z2, you can lose two disks. One of the things you want to look into, especially if uh, redundancy is a really big deal for the data that you're saving, and if you have a lot of disks, is you want to decide which RAID Z is your best uh, bet for both capacity and the ability to lose disks. Because uh, we all know that sometimes when one disk goes, other disks go. So you do want to be able to plan for that ahead of time. And one of the things that happens, so if a disk goes in a RAID Z, uh, the system still perks along. Uh, it'll let you know it's in a degraded state. And how you fix that is something called resilvering once you replace the disk. That's not when you want more disks to die, because it can actually stress the system. So you want to think ahead of time uh, how, which RAID Z is best for your needs. OK, so that's a bit of our introduction. If we take a look just basically what's happening with releases, so 8.0 was the redesign. It came out in May of 2011. And its focus was, let's just do the core. And then once that settles down, we'll start working on the modularity so that people can add more stuff. 8.2.0, July of last year, is when you were able to start adding your own software. And we called that the plugins architecture. 8.3.0 was very anticipated because we were waiting for ZFS version 28. Uh, which adds some more features. That was last October. We introduced full disk encryption uh, in March of this year, and we're getting ready to enter the beta phase uh, for the 9 series. So we're going to call the first one 9.10. So if we just do a quick overview of each of those. Uh, so the plugins architecture came out last July in 8.2.0. So that allows you to install software above the core NAS features. And it's based on the FreeBSD jail concept and PCBSD PBIs. So FreeBSD jails provide you a very lightweight way uh, to basically have a FreeBSD operating system installed. Uh, it's very lightweight. So because it's basically a FreeBSD operating system, you can go in and install, just like you would on any FreeBSD. So you can do packages and ports. Uh, but the cool thing is you can also use PBIs. 
So PBIs were invented uh, by Chris of the PCBSD project, and they provide a graphical way to install FreeBSD software, so you're not at the command line. What we did is we extended that API to allow the configuration file for that software to show up in the FreeNAS GUI. Because typically you're installing some sort of service and you want a nice way to go in and rather than looking in Etsy, where's its config file and how do I configure this, just do check boxes and path names and a GUI. So it's sort of a slick way of doing it. That architecture is uh, changing slightly in 9.1.0. So I left the URL to my slides that describes the 8.2.0 plugins architecture in more detail. 8.3.0 gave us CFS version 28. So this is when people got deduplication. Up to that point, uh, there was only RAID Z1 and Z2. So this added level three. There were some improvements to snapshots and the ability um, to uh, replace a log device. So in previous versions of ZFS, if your ZFS intent log was on a dedicated device and that device died and wasn't mirrored, you lost your pool, which can be a really big deal. <laughs> uh, with version 28, it's fine. You'll lose your last eight seconds worth of writes, but you don't lose your pool. So if you're using an older version of ZFS, there's a reason right there uh, to upgrade to 28. The other thing we got in that version is something called auto expand. And this allows, it's sort of the poor man's version of how do I increase my capacity. So typically the best way to increase drive capacity is to just stripe uh, another amount of disks uh, that's already running. Sometimes you don't have room to do that. So with auto expand, you can slowly and painfully, one by one, take out a disk, replace it with a larger one, let it resilver, go in and take out the second disk, and do that until your entire pool uh, has been um, increased. But auto expand lets you do that. It'll actually see the new disk space. 831 was the encryption. And one of the sad things that happened when uh, Sun was bought out by Oracle, ZFS had encryption in it, but it hadn't been open sourced yet, which means Oracle has ZFS encryption and nobody else gets to play with that. Also, they want to pay a lot of money. So we do not have ZFS version 30 encryption. It's not built into ZFS. Instead, we use FreeBSD Jelly encryption which works at the disk block level. So it's either on your disk or it's not on your disk. So it's not something you're doing on a, a per pool or per file system basis. But it is good for um, certain purposes. So for example, if you're in an environment uh, that stores sensitive data, um, this type of encryption, if somebody steals a disk or if somebody RMAs it and throws it out in the dumpster and someone finds it, they're not going to have access to the data on the disk. So that's basically what this type of encryption is going to gain you. Um, this will stay the same in 910, um, but that presentation, um, the presentation basically talked about the encryption system if you want more information. So let's move on to what's coming in 9.1. So anybody who's using FreeNAS now and who has a piece of hardware that wasn't supported in the 8 series will now rejoice because now it was probably fixed in 9. So we're going to get a whole bunch of new drivers and a whole bunch of bug fixes. So everything that happened in FreeBSD since the 8 days. The other thing that was a bit problematic in the 8 series is PCBSD has all kinds of PBIs that have already been made. There's well over a thousand, but they were all for the nine series. And in FreeBSD, whenever they go from a major series, say from eight to nine, uh, something known as the ABI changes. So you can't really run 8x software on 9x FreeBSD. So that opens up the possibility of a whole bunch of software that's already been created. 
uh, that you can install into FreeNAS. The volume manager. So the volume manager was created in eight and we had a year and a half worth of user feedback of all the stuff that people hated in the existing volume manager. So that has changed quite a bit. Uh, some of it was just the terminology because ZFS uses different terminology than UFS does. And it was hard, am I making a volume or a ZVOL or is this a, U a pool? What am I making here? So one of the ways we address that is we now have two volume managers, uh, one for UFS and one for ZFS. The other thing that was problematic in the old one is it wasn't very intuitive if I want to extend my pool by adding more disks, or if I want to add a log device, or I want to add another L2 arc. How you did that in the manager was not intuitive. And we would have all kinds of people panicking because a button says you're going to destroy your data if you do this, if you're extending, and it's like, it was very painful. So we've tried to make it so it's as intuitive as possible. The other thing that you couldn't really do in the old volume manager is figure out, well, how much capacity am I going to get? If I throw in six 40 gig drives in a RAID Z2, what's that going to give me? The new volume manager will actually tell you. And you can go ahead and look at the various RAID levels and see which one is appropriate. And we do have a lot of um, people who use uh, very large FreeNAS systems that are dealing with a lot of disks. And it was painful adding more than three or four disks into a pool. So we've tried to fix all of this. And I'll show you a couple of screenshots. I don't know how well they're going to show on this, but we'll see what we can see. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> was, with lights off, would that make a difference? Or is that going to ruin the camera? OK. Well, you guys can look at the slides uh, when you, when you um, get home. So one of the things we did, so we when you, this is uh, ZFS, um, so we have a USS, UFS volume manager and a ZFS. If you're creating a new volume, you give it a name. If you're extending a volume, you just say that you, you're extending an existing volume and specify the name. When you're creating a volume, you can uh, choose to use encryption and you can um, uh, initialize the disk blocks before doing so. One of the things uh, we've done here, so here I just um, got a screenshot from VirtualBox. This system had five disks, and before I went and selected the disks, it's told me up here I had five disks and the, and the sizes. Here it's showing I have no more drives because I've already selected, so I have no more available. When I go to lay out my volume, typically what you're creating is a pool or you're adding to an existing pool. And here you can stretch out for as many disks as you want. And here I've selected four of the five disks. When you're doing this live, you can use the drop down to look at your RAID levels. And it will actually tell you here in a RAID C2, if I have four 10.7 gig uh, disks, I'm going to end up with 20 gigs worth of capacity. And it's telling me that that's an optimal configuration. The GUI will not let you uh, create a RAID Z that doesn't have enough disks to support that configuration. And it will also tell you, so with ZFS, there's a concept of a, a VDEV. So there's an optimal number of disks to put into a RAID Z to give you the best performance. So for example, if I had 20 disks, I won't get optimal performance if I throw all 20 in at once. I'm actually better to do groups of five, six, or seven, uh, depending upon the RAID Z. And this will actually go red if I pick a non-optimal amount of disks. So we have all the documentation that we know you've read before you started to set up your disks. <laughs> but the GUI will also remind you this isn't probably the best way to do it. This one here, it's a bit hard to see, but in the drop down, I've chosen to create a ZIL or a log device. So I'm dedicating this disk, it could also be an SSD, uh, to hold my ZFS log. When you set up your pool, if you want, you can create multiple pools at the same time. And here you just add an extra device. 
So I could, for example, set up three pools, I could set up a mirrored sill, I could set up an L2 Arc device, and these would all be displayed in here. And it just lets me work with the disks and devices I have to play with. Uh, this screen here assumes that I've already made a volume. So I have a volume, what did I call it here, volume one. And once you have a volume, you can start creating data sets. Or if you are uh, planning on using iSCSI, you can create device extents using a Zvol. Uh, basically, it's just going to be to the client. It's going to look like a disk that they can format and do what they want with. When you're creating a data set, uh, you give it a name. You can set compression on it if you want. Uh, you can decide uh, whether the A time is recorded or not. You can also do thin and thick provisioning, and those in ZFS terms are called quota and reserved space. You can set up deduplication. And for some workloads, um, being able to specify the work, uh, the record size is a nice thing to do. And we have some documentation on that. So those have been added. Those, a lot of those features weren't there before. And the last thing we did here is an example of creating a Zvol. So I'm getting ready to do iSCSI. Uh, so you set the size of your Zvol. You can set compression. You can do uh, thick provisioning with a sparse volume, and you can also set a block size. So that's one of the major changes. Uh, the other major change is uh, the plugins architecture. So the plugins, the, the modularity and the ability to work in a FreeBSD jail is a good thing, and users like that. But pretty much the first question out of users' mouths was, can I have a second jail? Can I create multiple jails? So we did a redesign to allow for that. So this can, for example, allow you to run uh, different services in different jails. So you actually get um, the distinction between those. You have that separation. And how we did that is we imported uh, Warden uh, that's used by PCBSD. Uh, to manage different types of jails. So you can actually fire up as many jails uh, that you want. You can create multiple types of jails. Uh, one of the things I saw went in last night because they were having problems with it, but they fixed it. Uh, you can even install Linux in a jail. So Linux jails are supported. This opens up how the, you install software. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways. So you can do FreeNAS PBIs to integrate into the GUI. You can do PCB, PCBSD PBIs, FreeBSD packages, FreeBSD ports, and the new FreeBSD package new generation for package NG. Those are all supported. And we also uh, redid the GUI to make it more intuitive when you're creating your jails. Uh, now that you can go in and create as many as you want. So we'll take a bit of a quick peek at that. So the biggest um, user problems that we saw with the old jail system is a lot of people didn't understand the concept of a jail basically being another operating system. It's like another network or another node on your network. So they could never figure out what IP address do I give this thing? Can it be the same as the FreeNAS system or can it be on some other network? Or it's really basically another host in your network that's hosting a service that you want your users to get at. We've taken away that complexity by um, getting you to set up ahead of time what network do you want to use. And you can set up a range of addresses and it'll automatically assign the correct IP address and subnet mask. The other thing that we do is before you can add a jail, you have to set a configuration, and basically what you're setting is the jail root. You're saying in which uh, directory or data set do you want me to create your jails. And we do recommend that you use ZFS and you dedicate a data set uh, to your jail, so that way you can manage it with snapshots uh, and all the other ZFS goodness. When you create a jail, whatever your root is, 
it will automatically create, if it's CFS, a uh, child data set for each jail, and they'll live in your root. If you're using UFS, it will create a directory for each jail. So you go in, you say where you want your jails to be created, you give it a network range uh, that is accessible to your users. And then from there, to add a jail, all you have to do is give it a name, and you can go in. By default, if all you do is give it a name and press enter, it's going to be a plug-in jail, and it's going to get the first IP address that was available in that range. But we do have an advanced mode uh, for users who like a bit more control. So you can actually go in and decide, oh, I really wanted a different IP address. Uh, you can set that. Jails are now accessible over IP version 6. That's something we didn't have in the old design. You can decide whether the jail starts automatically uh, at system boot, and you can do the, uh, the type of jail. So there's going to be four uh, supported types. We call them plug-in supports standard and Linux. You can include FreeBSD source during jail creation time. You can include FreeBSD ports or you can just say, no, this is just a vanilla uh, jail that I want to create. And one of the nice things, so in the old design, you had to actually go in and download a piece of software called the Plugins Jail. You had to go in and install ports by yourself, source by yourself. Here, it does it for you. And the first time you create a jail, it's going to download a small tarball, and then it will always use that for further jail creation. So subsequent jails are going to be instantaneous. Give it a name and you have a new jail. The other thing that users didn't like is there really wasn't much feedback on what's happening when you're creating a jail. So here is the first time I'm doing a jail, so it has to download that file. And it's actually telling me the command that it's using to do that. And it lets me know um, how the progress of the download is going. So you get a bit more feedback. Here I've created a jail, I called it jail1. Um, it didn't get it in the screenshot, but there's buttons down here that let you start and stop the jail to delete a jail. It's going to tell me that this jail is currently running. And once the jail is running, it's going to show up in your tree. And I can go in and I can edit its uh, settings so I could change its IP address. In the old plugin system, we had something um, called mount points. So you basically, your jail is basically a FreeBSD operating system, uh, which is separate from your storage. But with the mount point, you could go in and say, I want you to have access to this part of my storage. So if you're doing something like transmission, where you need to store stuff, it'll actually store on your NAS device. We now call those add storage, try to be a bit more intuitive, and you could also make directories within that storage, and it would go directly to your NAS system. Um, the, if you're using the plugins jail, uh, you have a button called install plugin, and basically once it's installed, it'll add it to the GUI. We don't have any plugins built yet, so I couldn't show you that screenshot, um, but those should be coming in the next week or so. And we have a, a bunch of little changes. Um, so Shell we've had since last July, for those that like to work in the command line. A couple of problems with that is you could copy, but you couldn't paste, which was rather inconvenient. So we now have paste. Um, and you also couldn't resize the shell. So sometimes things would get truncated. And it, was real, it was real irritating. Uh, now you can go in and set the size of the window. Um, the other thing that could be irritating is if you're using the graphical admin uh, interface and you have a flashing red alert and it's something that you know about, it was always flashing until you fixed it. Now there's a nice little checkbox next to it and it's like, I know that, uncheck it and just won't flash at you anymore. So it expects you know what you're doing. We now have an option where you can go in and set when scripts um, are run. So you can have scripts run during system initialization or during shutdown. 
There's a nice GUI for that. Uh, we now have support for NIS, or Yellow Pages. You can configure that through the GUI. And is that for authentication of like admins or authentication for uh, work tools? Right now it's just users and permissions. We're hoping in 911 to add other NIS attributes. Oh yes, L LDAP's been supported, yeah. Um, with replication, it always happened as root. Now you can go in and configure what user gets used. Uh, you can set your logging level and facility for SFTP. Um, you can now override the default NFS bind ports, uh, specify which ones you want to use. And a really handy tool uh, is Zillstat. And you run this tool and it will actually give you a good idea whether your system would perform better with a dedicated log. So whether it's worth your while adding a Zill device. Because for some workloads, the Zill doesn't help you at all, put it on another system. So we have a whole bunch of resources. We have our website, forums, bug tracker, user's guide. We're on IRC on Freenode, let me picture that. And there's the URL to the slides, and that's my contact info. Uh, any questions? Yes. Um, any benchmarks like if I have a gigabit connection and I'm using NFS, how much throughput do I get, whether it's you know, large files, medium files, small files? Yep, so the question was, are there any uh, benchmarks? We do have some command line tools, and we have a, a chapter in our documentation which needs more love from an uh, end user point of view. Uh, but some of the, there are tools called uh, ArcStat Summary. We have that. Um, and we have, oh, what's the other one? So typically DD is not the best way to do it. I think it's XDD. And we have IOStat. So we do have a bunch of command line utilities. Um, for people publishing their benchmark results, we do have a performance section in the forums where people are starting to do that. And there's a couple of users that are really good at that. And they um, talk about things like if I'm reading uh, my ARC summary stats, what is it that I'm looking for? And how am I going to tell if um, adding another ARC device changed anything? So, so we're starting to get some information like that. So the question is, what's the upgrade process? We support uh, two different types of upgrades. Um, so you can upgrade right from the GUI. Um, as in any upgrade, we always recommend that you have a backup, uh, though it's very rare that an upgrade is, is going to affect your system. Um, so we do have uh, files that you download. They're upgrade. You just run it in the GUI. You point to that file. It reboots your system. And in theory, you come back and everything's happy. The other thing which I usually tell people, the only thing you care about is the data on your disk and you care about the configuration that you made unless you're getting paid by the hour and you really like to redo your configs. So the only thing as far as um, having your settings saved is you always make sure that you have a recent copy of your configuration and you just go in the GUI and you press the button and it saves it to your workstation. So even if things went terribly wrong and your flash drive or your, your CF card died and the OS went kaput, all you have to do is uh, burn the image uh, onto, that, onto another device, import your disk and import your config and you're back to where you were. So it's one of the reasons why we made sure there was a separation uh, between storage and your um, operating system. So the worst that could happen is an upgrade didn't work, and then you could always boot into the previous one, and if for some reason you couldn't do that, you would just uh, install a new operating system. Yep. What's the size of a, just a base OS? The OS itself? Just, just setting up a baseline memory um, without a lot of jail for anything. For, for the hardware or for the OS? Yeah, so right now, so the, 
the image itself is only about 800 megs, so uncompressed. We, um, right now in the 8 series, say use a 2 gig stick because it's going to divide it in two, one for your previous OS and one for your new one with a little bit of room. We've added uh, some stuff in 9, which is going to bring us up to a 4 gig stick. And what we found, especially with the two gig sticks, is a lot of the cheaper USB drives don't give you two gig capacity, and you really needed a four gig stick anyways. But it's really hard trying to find a, a stick, even trying to buy one these days that small, yeah. I think we have room for one more question. Yep. Supported hardware, do you have the supported hardware for this? Yep. <coughs> So we do have a uh, section in our documentation called hardware, uh, where we basically give recommendations depending upon your needs. And what the supported hardware will always be what's on the FreeBSD hardware compatibility list. Yeah. So if you're looking for a specific driver, that's where you'd go to look. Okay, thank you. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. 
These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astris based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astris or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing 
is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. <laughs>